Hi, my name is Carmen. Welcome to Story Critical. Today we'll be reviewing The Labyrinth by Kat Richardson. And I want to apologize. I thought I recorded this, but then I looked over on my computer and it hadn't been recorded. So I'm going to try my best, even though I just went through this video, but I might be a little annoyed. So this book is book five of a series. Well, first of all, how do I think this book is, or how would I rate this book? It is a three out of five, right on the cusp of four out of five. So where I think I tend to place a lot of books where it's good. I finished the book and I might be willing to continue the series depending on how bored I am and what other options I have because it definitely wasn't the worst thing I've ever read, but I didn't particularly love it either. This is the fifth book in a series which I did not know when I picked it up. I had seen the also by section, so it goes Grey Walker, Poltergeist, Underground, Vanish. And on the front it said Labyrinth, a Grey Walker novel. So like you could infer that it's part of a series, but nowadays unless things have like book one of, th you know, book one, book two, book three, you don't necessarily know how connected the books are. Like, are they sharing the same setting? Are they sharing the same characters, but a different conflict? This book is connected to the previous books pretty closely where there's an ongoing conflict. And, but it wasn't bad. Even though I had just, I started on this book, I never read the previous ones. I was able to understand what was going on with the story, which I think is a real matter of credit towards the writer to share information in a way that can get a new reader up to speed. I don't know if it would have irritated me if I already knew what was going on and if it would have been like too slow and too much repetition of what had happened in the past, but as a new reader it was great. Um, so as far as the magic system goes, there's lots of different types of, well, first of all, it's set in Seattle. Um, it, so it's our world too. It's a urban fantasy. And it there's vampires, witches, like necromancy, and gray walkers as far, oh, and like gods, right? So the a gray walker, she sometimes, our main character Harper sometimes is the Grey Walker. She sometimes gets referred to as Ghost Girl. And the Grey is also considered kind of like this liminal space. Like at one point in the book, she says she's in the underground of Seattle because Seattle has like, like a part of the city that, I'll, I'll pull up a picture. Yeah, where like the old city was built on top of, and you, you can take tours of it. Um, so like, that's a picture of what the underground looks like. And she's like, there's no place more gray than, in, or in Seattle, there's no place more gray than the underground. I'm missing, I'm messing up the words a little bit, but you get the point. But then the gray is also where people go and they die. It's where their souls go and they join what Harper describes as like a grid and another character, the necromancer describes as like a tapestry, but essentially the souls of the dead are how magic happens. At least from what I understood from what was being described, because our main character throughout the course of the book gets the ability to touch the grid and change how magic works. She can, one of the characters described it as like, he works with the weave, but she can stand on the weft and control the weft, which if you're a tapestry person, maybe you know what that means. Um, and so as far as the gray goes, she can, or her abilities as a gray walker, she can see the spells of all the different other types of magic because they're visible in the gray. She can see emotions sort of, if she's kind of phased out. They, I think they call it like phasing. I don't know what they call it. Um, but she essentially, 
become slightly less visible in the physical world, but can see in, in the other world. And even sometimes she can grab onto what she, the author calls a temporal climb and like phase into a different time period, which is how she, when she's in the underground of Seattle running away from someone, she changes her time period to when the underground was above ground and then goes back to the present time. So there's a little bit of time travel abilities wrapped in there too. There's, um, like I said, she gets the magic abilities. She can talk to ghosts. She can, you know, get impressions off of objects. Pretty much just your generic load of everything. The most unique ability of a gray walker is when they're dead or when they're killed, they can come back to life. And no one really knows. There is a point where they don't come back to life, but no one really knows where that is. But it creates a sense of, it's an, it's an attempt to create dramatic tension or to create tension when there really isn't because it's been evidenced from what I was able to pick up from the book that this character has died and come back multiple times and she even dies and comes back in this book. Um, sorry, spoiler. Not really if you read the rest of the series though because it seems like it's pretty standard fare. Um, and it gets talked about a lot too, so it's not really... Where they, and each time they die, their powers have the chance to change. Because there's lots of different gray walkers mentioned throughout the book, and it's not like she's a unique one of a kind. So there's different gray walkers, and when they die and come back, they can have slightly different powers. If that makes any sense. So it's kind of just whatever the author needs her powers to be, that book, from what I was gathering. Um... So on to the characters. We have Harper, who is, you know, your classic urban fantasy PI, because it's urban fantasy. And then, and she's the Great Walker. She's likable enough. She's not the most likable, but she does, she's not horrible. She just is. And then there's Quentin, who is not the protagonist. But he exists in a kind of in-between state where he's he's pretty much an elevated plot device. He does three things, well, four things primarily in the story. Yeah, sorry, I got a little bit of a sore throat. I'm gonna take some water. I forgot what my points were in the past on the previous time I gave this video. It's okay though. So he exists as her significant other romance interest with a romantic interest with a semi, while it's never explicit, it's very much, there's some crass words used back and forth between them and you know, about their activities. And then he also provides some comic relief and his, and whenever she's starting to have any sort of moral depth, he rushes to assure her that she's perfect and one of a, and so special and just doing nothing wrong. And he also provides our source of information. So there's like, at least in this book alone, there was probably four plus times where Harper would be confused about something that she's been mulling over for a while and she would mention something and then Quentin would proceed to give us an info dump. And he's like an expert on all these unrelated things too, whatever is needed to push the plot forward, where at one point he's an expert on labyrinths and mazes. One point he's an expert in like electricity and that sort of thing. He just has a very eclectic, and I think he, I think the author kind of lampshades it by herself by being like, oh, he has such eclectic knowledge, right? Where it, it really falls flat for me because, like, one of the things Harper knew about from the beginning of the book, and when she finally mentions it to Quentin, Quentin provides like the info dump that then allows her to finish like drawing a conclusion. So it's kind of like he's providing all the background information, but she still gets to be the one drawing the conclusions. But the point is, if she had just like talked to him about it from the very beginning, most of the book wouldn't have needed to happen. Um, 
So he doesn't have too, too much of a character. So probably on to spoilers now. Oh, pros, pros real quick. It's, there is a mix of um, perspectives. The prologue and the last chapter are written from Quentin's perspective, and those are third person past tense. But the majority of the book is first person past tense from Harper's perspective. And it's fine. It works. The language is, for the most part, pretty utilitarian. But there are periods where it's more poetic. But it never becomes, like, uh, too much. At least in my opinion. Yours might differ. But I'm trying to find the one I read in the past. But I might have deleted it. This isn't the one I used before, but it's okay. His touch was hot and cold, sharp as electricity, aroused the chorus and made me want to scream with them and shove him away. I gulped in air and swallowed the vo- I groped in air and swallowed the voices. No, you won't, not there. And then I cut it off. Um so it, it's it's descriptive but mostly utilitarian. Um couple other just kind of comments of things that aren't really spoilers, but I just find kind of really is. So it was in Seattle, or it was set in Seattle. And prior to, prior to this book, I'd always thought that it would be kind of interesting to read a book that was set in a city that I know well, but that was not the case. I actually found it really bad. There was a lot of when she, cause she would give these background pieces of information about these areas of Seattle, they're like neighborhoods, right? And oftentimes the words she would use to describe them are not the words I would use to describe them in terms of like their economic status. And it, it kind of really created this dissonance between me and the character. Like, cause she was presenting Harper as this somewhat scrappy, independent PI, you know, just trying to get by through life. But she lives in West Seattle, which is not, it's not the most expensive area of Seattle, but it's also not cheap. And like at one point she goes to the FedEx World Center or whatever in Georgetown and she lo- she's described as loading these crates into her Land Rover. And like Land Rovers also aren't cheap cars. So it was hard to see her as like the scrappy underdog when she's affluent or has all the signs of being affluent. Um, so that just sort of, I think authors need to be more aware of that, like how their descriptions of things are actually making the character look uh, and whether or not it's consistent. Of note, as far as, I guess this should have been in the prose section, but there are a couple spelling and grammar errors. And while I don't really care, they weren't bad enough to make me stop. They were hardly enough for me to pause and do a double take. You know, people go after self-published authors for being, having less, or being less polished, right? So I think it's important to point out that there are errors in every book. Like this book was published by Penguin or the Penguin Group, right? And I found multiple errors. The There was at one point a misspelling of an area of Seattle called Ballard. She missed the R. I don't know. It's not a big deal. It was just kind of funny because then in like the next page or the next chapter it was spelled correctly. So she could have just control f for like missing a couple letters and see if it came up, right? But I don't really care. It wasn't that big of a deal. But there was consistent absence of commas between independent clauses. Now, that might be a rule of grammar that's in the midst of changing because grammar rules do change. But I'm going to look it up right now and see what we find. So it says, according to Purdue Owl, which I always used to when I was in college, 
Use commas to separate independent clauses when they are joined by any of these seven coordinating conjunctions, and, but, for, or, nor, so, yet. And then I have another one from UW Madison, where a comma is used before coordinating conjunctions Com, uh, or conjunct, before the coordinating conjunction, parenthetical, unless the two independent clauses are very short, and parenthetical. That's kind of imprecise. How do you define short or not? I will say that I do not know that I saw, there was at least, I stopped counting at like 10 missed commas between co uh, independent clauses. Now, throughout this book, both when the subject was the same, like if she said I, X, Y, Z, and I, X, Y, Z. And when the subject was different, like he, X, Y, Z, comma. And, well, no, there was no comma. And I, X, Y, Z, right? So those, as long as there's a subject and a verb, it's an independent clause. And I think, you know, if the, if the subject's the same, you know, what? Well, like I said, I don't really care. I just care because it's, we shouldn't hold traditionally published books up on this pedestal when they have mistakes in them too. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, on to, the, on to the spoiler portion of it, maybe. Right? So, the actual plot of this book is as a Grey Walker, there's this villain, well, antagonist called Wygan, and he's a different type of vampire. He's like an Egyptian vampire, and they're more or less psychic vampires because they feed off of like emotions and chaos. And he used to be an Egyptian god, but his power is waning, and his like subject vampires are having troubles. But he wants to be restored to power, so his big goal is to keep killing Harper or whatever Grey Walker he happens to be focused on at the time until they become the type of Grey Walker he needs to execute his plan, which I'm going to save for you if you read the book. But his plan essentially would end with the Grey and the mortal world mixing and all the monsters from the Grey coming into the mortal world, creating all sorts of chaos and mayhem. It... So does Harper end up becoming that type of vampire or Grey Walker? Yeah. And when she is, she has this ability where she can touch the magic, she can control it, you know, but it's killing her because it, there's like this degree of dissociation in the gray. Where like once the souls join with what she calls the grid, they don't have emotions anymore. So it, it's kind of scaring her. Luckily, her dad is around. He's dead, but he's, he's around to be like, don't worry, if you die, I'll make sure you, you leave behind this part that's dangerous for you. So of course... And while this is probably a giant spoiler, but I don't know what's happened in the other books apparently too, of course the book ends with her dying and coming back to life. Um, kind of like that great reset fun, right? And the last, the last paragraph actually, or two, actually made me laugh. It's just so funny because it's like, it reads like this. Quentin shivered breathing too roughly around the heavy constriction in his chest and throat. His hands trembled, brushing the fallen teardrops off Harper's face. How would he ever draw another breath with this feeling in his chest? It was like dying himself. Next paragraph. Then Harper blinked. And end of the book. So it was just like... <laughs> like, it wasn't a cliffhanger, really, because Harper ended up coming back to life. But at the same time, it's... It's just, it, was, it was just funny. It was just funny how it was written. Um, now that we're kind of talking about the end part, I can talk about one of the things that annoyed me so much about Harper's character. Sorry, I had a burp. Um, so from like a previous book, it seems like she has this boyfriend. I forget his name. And he showed, but he, okay, let me start at a different spot. So throughout the book, Harper is reflecting on like how everyone around her dies and she's just so dangerous to be around and something terrible always happens to them. And every time she brings this up and like 
tries to talk about it, Quentin is like, sorry, I keep saying like, I don't know. Quentin immediately goes into like saying, you're not the problem. You're not the one killing them. It's not your fault. Don't blame yourself. Right. But if she kind of, if she knows that she also brings characters into what she knows are dangerous environments. Like at one point she sends a character to her apartment to get something for her and then something happens. I don't think the character dies, but like the character ends up being really scared and, you know, almost gets killed. And it's like, well, she is kind of responsible for what happens to that character because she sent them to do a task. You know, imagine a leader that's like, yeah, I'm just going to send you to the battlefield, but I'm not responsible if you die. It's the other soldiers, right? It's just sort of really immature. That's how I would describe it. She's just kind of immature in her refusal to take responsibility for her own actions. And it's like, yes, she's not pulling the trigger. She's not the one casting the magic. She's not the one doing the torturing. But if she's consistently putting people in positions that she knows are dangerous, she's not necessarily without any guilt. Like, yes, it might not be her intentions, but it's still the outcome of her actions. You know, so and actions do have consequences, whether good or bad. You know, consequence just, you know, it's what happens. It's the end of it's the next thing in the sequence, right? I think that's kind of the root. I don't know. I'm not actually that good with words. But, and I, I think it's most evident with this boyfriend of hers from a previous book whom she, so like, I'm pretty sure he's from a previous book, but he shows up in this book and he says to her, you know, I need you. You're the only one who can bring me peace, all this other stuff. And she's looking at him and keep in mind, he, from what was referenced about what happened in the past, he was tortured because of his relationship to her or something about that. Somehow or other, he was tortured and tormented because of his association with her. And she's looking at him and she can see how he's just in such emotional turmoil and like all over the place. And she says to more, she says more or less to him, I can't help you. You need to go back to your brother and, and you need to heal and recover. And Quentin is over there being like, she's my girlfriend now. Get away. (laughs) Sorry. That's just sort of how it read to me. Um, like, and then Harper, feeling guilt, as she should, like, helps him just the one time in her mind. She says, just this once, I'll do this, right? So she reaches out and she calms his emotions so that he's sort of more even and then, you know, tells him to go away, right? And it's revealed, too, that ever since he was tortured or whatever was done to him in a previous book, He's also been more associated with the gray, like he can sort of see what's going on, but he's not really a full gray walker, but he's not as he was. But, you know, and luckily for Harper, she she doesn't even have to worry about feeling guilt because he ends up being, he ends up being sacrificed by the villain that's after her at the end of this book. Yeah, he's just, he's just blood sacrifice, done, dead. You no more need to feel any responsibility over this man's torture, right? So not only is this character, this ex-boyfriend, tortured on her behalf, and then tortured again in this book on her behalf, but then he's killed. Well, not on her behalf. He's tortured because of his association with her twice. And then he ends up being killed because of his association with her. And she's like, it's not my fault. Except not... but. But the author's smart enough to know she can't do that without, like, annoying people. So she has Harper have, like, the start of moral twinging. And then whenever she starts to express it, she has Quentin to rush in and say, It's not your fault. You're perfect. You're not at all responsible for what happened. And I hate that. And if she was going to do it, if she was going to do that to the ex like that, she shouldn't have given us the scene of Harper actually being able to help him. Because then it feels even more immoral like she's not responsible for what happened to him she's she's really like you can argue that she's not with she didn't wield the knife 
you know, she didn't do anything bad to him besides date him. And I think at that point she didn't know how dangerous she was to the general health of the people around her. But she shows, the author shows us that through Harper settling his emotions and kind of driving away the nightmares for him, that Harper could help him. So then when she says, I can't help you, what she really should have said is, I don't want to help you, or I don't feel like I sh need to help you. But that wouldn't have come across quite as good. And I think I wouldn't have felt quite so offended on the ex's behalf if Harper hadn't been shown that she actually could have helped him. And I think it's particularly bad because, you know, she, I get what the author was trying to do, where, like, the ex was, like, like a, someone who breaks up with their boyfriend is not responsible for the emotional turmoil that the boyfriend goes through as a result of the breakup, right? Like, that is manipulative and abusive behavior for the boyfriend to try, for the ex to try and, or even the boyfriend if it's current, to try and hold the woman accountable for his emotions. But I do feel like the analogy breaks down when you start to include psychic vampires, magic, and torture. It's not the same as in a, like, it's, it's not the same as in our real world. It, breaking up with him and then having him be like, I need you, Harper. I need you to balance my emotions. I need you. And like, the real world is not the same as I was tortured because I was your boyfriend and the person who's after you came after me trying to get to you. And now I have these psychic scars and all of this pain and rage and hurt and trauma. And I know you have the ability to help me. Please help me. Right? Sounds completely different. At least in my opinion. Um, a couple other things then. Another thing that I found... So the author has this great author's note in the back. It was really enjoyable to read. And it kind of just... She goes into like the research she does for the books. And it's a little bit of a glossary too for the terms she's made up and how she got them, what their linguistic roots were. And I loved it. I think... Unfortunately, I did read it, right? And unfortunately, it was me who read it. Because one of her paragraphs is, The Asatem Ankastet and their Pharaoh, a.k.a. Wygan, the, the antagonist villain, and his children, um, are entirely my creation. So far as I could discover, there aren't any legendary vampires in Egyptian mythology, but I'd already gotten started on the tale and pretty much had to leave it in. I ran across a few references along, online to the church of Astetka, but was never able to get any substantive information about this group, what it is or its origins in the time I had. I borrowed part of the name and then twisted and played with it to my own ends, in parentheticals, and just in case there are any copyright issues, and parenthetical, but the vampires and their details are all mine and not extracted or borrowed from another source. So, that's great, except you describe Wigan, Wigan, whatever, the Pharaoh, as the white worm man, which definitely was giving me like Dune vibes too, especially like how in the psychic realm, or sorry, the gray, he's pretty much a worm, a giant, well, misshapen thing, right? Um, and I couldn't help but think uh, wait, did I, did I read that section about, is that the one with, oh, no. So, and then when we pair that part that she, I had read from her part with her definition of the throne Anka Estet, aka, AKA Wigan, the god king of the Asatem, he is the dwindling remains of an ancient serpent god, which I cobbled up from the numerous snake gods found in legends throughout Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Okay. So hear me out. There's an Egyptian snake god called Apep. Gonna make sure I'm spelling that right. Yeah, A-P-E-P. -E -P. Now this snake god is the Egyptian god of darkness and chaos 
And he's also been called the eater of souls. That's one of his like epithets. So you have a snake god that you wanted something Egyptian for, for psychic vampires who f- wants to break into the realm of the dead where the souls are to power him and his people and they feed off of chaos and you're telling me that that was not pep you know i don't really believe you maybe you didn't find him but i was able to find it really quick by just searching egyptian snake god so that's my opinion on that and like maybe maybe you didn't want to just use op pep maybe you wanted to do something different that's your prerogative but it felt like i was being lied to when i read that and sorry about you i know you my viewers aren't actually her right but it felt like i was being lied to by the author because she could have just said oh you know i read some myths about Apep the Egyptian snake god of chaos and darkness and eater of souls, but I didn't want to do exactly that. I wanted something more original, so I also included bits of this and that. So it just felt disingenuous. Um, The other side of that, too, is like, she's like, I couldn't find any Egyptian vampires, right? Well, there's also the myth of Sekhmet, the lion-headed goddess, who was like on a bloodthirsty rampage for a little bit of time until... The rest of the people and gods got concerned, so they got a bunch of alcohol. And I'm just kind of remembering this myth. I'm not looking it up. But they got a bunch of alcohol, it might have been beer, and dyed it red. And then she drank it all, thinking it was blood, and then passed out from drunkenness. And when she woke up, she wasn't, you know, in a bloodthirsty rage anymore. So, I mean, that's kind of vampiric, too. So I just, like, it's just hard when... Just be honest. Like, what? I want to know what your search terms were because apparently you're telling me you didn't search Egyptian snake god while looking for an Egyptian snake god, and you didn't search eater Egyptian eater of souls when you were looking for psychic vampires having to de- wanting to feed off of the souls of the dead to power their own energy, and you didn't search Egyptian myths about drinking blood because you would have come up with segment. So what did you search? And by you, I mean Kat. What did Kat search? I don't know. Um, anyways, would I read another book by this author? Maybe, maybe not. Um, it, it wasn't bad, it really wasn't. I'm being, kind, I'm being critical for the sake of being critical. If I was bored and had nothing else to read and it was like someone offered it to me to read on a trip, I probably would read it, it was okay. It was, but I enjoy Dresden Files more, or the Dresden series more, which, by the way, I requested the two most recent books because I realized they came out, so I'm hopefully going to get those from the library soon. Um, But, so if you like urban fantasy and you like PI setting, or PI characters, private investigator, and you like the magic, I think it would be a great book. You'd probably enjoy it do I, I think I might hold out for a series I enjoy more, but it wasn't, in no way was this book terrible. It was very finishable. It was very, once the story got started, it was pretty enjoyable. There was, you know, a couple eye rolls, a couple like, ah, uh, but it was for the most part great. I really liked the character Carlos, which was the necromancer vampire. I thought he was great. I thought he was really interesting, and I actually think he was one of the more developed characters of the book. Like, I would love to see a story about him. I'd probably pick that up in a heartbeat because, you know, he was super interesting from having had a deep, intense relationship with another vampire that's mentioned in the book, Edward, of course, right, Um, to taking on an apprentice, to all this other stuff. He was just an interesting character. Um, and then the other reason I probably wouldn't continue to read this book is the gray kind of made me uncomfortable. It kind of gave me that same ick feeling 
when when it was described as you know souls and like a power grid and like they don't have any like emotion or any of that it just sort of gave me that same ick as like warhammer 40k does where like there's very little dark fantasy i consider truly dark warhammer 40k even though you might argue it's sci-fi my opinion is fantasy because there's gods and magic sorry it is but Like, with Warhammer 40k, it has a... It's even more so than in this book, where it's like, your life is awful. Your worlds are awful. And then you die. And that's awful, too. And it's like, okay, well, then what's the point of living if everything's awful, right? I think, you know, I think we definitely... If if I lived in a Warhammer 40k world, I'd probably be like... What are they called? The anti... The people who, like, don't believe in having children because until they're born, they don't know suffering, but once they're born, they do. Anyways, just because, like, it's so bad, right? If there's no, if there's no way of hope, what's the point? And, like, so, like I said, the gray wasn't quite that bad, but it did sort of give me that same ick feeling. And that must be the in thing right now, because another book I'm going to review that I finished last week, too, has that same... Sort of like magic is souls ickness to it, and not like not like magic is your own soul, but like you become part of the web weave of magic sort of thing, which is fine. It's a choice. I just don't particularly love it. I, I it kind of gives me that ick. I'm sorry, it does. Anyways talked enough about that. So if you read this book or another book by this author, please let me know what you think, whether you agree or disagree. If you have any recommendations for me to read, please leave them down below and I will try to source them from the library. Though do be aware that I can be a pretty critical person. If you want to see more, leave a like, subscribe, and tell me what exactly you want to see more of and I will do my best to accommodate you. Thank you. Hope to see you next time.